gonna turn it off in my, but standing by. Hello everyone and welcome to design meeting. I'm gonna hand it over to Portia to start us off with a land acknowledgement. So this is a digital land acknowledgement. It's used with permission from Adrian Wong of Spiderweb Show in Kingston, Canada. She wrote the statement originally for the Festival of Living Digital Art. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints contributing to the changing climates that disproportionately affect the indigenous peoples worldwide. We invite you to join us in acknowledging all this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time, and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. And back hey. to you. Thank you, Portia. Yeah, and I'm just going to, uh, you know, invite us all to like take this moment and all moments going forward to think about going beyond land acknowledgement, which is a great step and a great protocol to start integrating into your own practice. Um, but other ways that you can do that are to find out about paying land tax to your local tribe, um, go to programming by the indigenous peoples of your area and any area. You can like read work by awesome contemporary and uh, native writers and writers of past, watch all of the amazing content that is being streamed right now. Um, and also uh, encourage the organizations that you're working at to, if they're not already uh, in the practice of doing a land acknowledgement and building a real relationship with the indigenous peoples of the land that their theater or other organization is on to do that. Um, it's something that we as designers can do when we go into any organization. So um, I just want to take a moment before we uh, really go into everything um, to just pause um, and acknowledge the events of the week where we find ourselves right now. Um, we, <laughs> I am loca located in Lenape Hoking, uh, known in colonized terms as New York City, and we just had massive flooding, um, more so than we've seen in like 100 years. Uh, the hurricane, uh, from the aftermath of the hurricane that hit um, much of the South, including uh, a lot of devastation in New Orleans. Um, there uh, was a huge hurricane or a huge earthquake in Haiti. Um, we're in the middle of intense clashes in Afghanistan. There is a very active attack on women's rights and reproductive rights in Texas. Um, we are continuing to get news of uh, graves being unearthed in residential schools all across Turtle Island. Um, and we're still in the middle of the COVID pandemic. Um, so there's a lot going on right now and we are holding that in our bodies. And we are coming to you in this moment to talk about theater um, and the continued work that we're doing inside of this uh, industry. Um, so we are holding all of these things together, um, but that's a lot, so. Just wanted to like name those things and pause before we before we go on. So what we're gonna do now, um, Portia and I are gonna introduce ourselves. <laughs> um, and then we'll then we'll get going. Um, you wanna start us off, Portia? No, but Kate is making me, so I'll do it. <laughs> Uh, uh, I hate introductions, but okay, fine. Uh, I'm Portia McGovern. I'm on the unceded lands of the Munse, Lenape, and Wappinger, colonially known as Connecticut. And do I have to say anything else? Let's hope not. No, um, you're good. Oh, good. Over to Kate. <laughs> we'll do proper intros and the check in. But yeah, and I'm Kate Freer. Um, as I said, I'm on Lenape Hoking, um, the stolen ancestral homelands of the Lenape peoples. And Portia and I are co-curators of the uh, series Design in a Time of Reckoning, which this is the final day. Huzzah. Yes. Back to you. <laughs> I thought there was going to be more after final day. Nope. I was that's waiting. It. <laughs> nope. Good. So we want to say thank you to all our awesome contributors from both the first week 
And now this, the second week, Clint Ramos, Lindsay Jones, Sarish Mosgani, Amber Watley, look, I got it, <laughs> Calvin Anderson, Elsa Hiltner, and Genevieve Beller. Yeah. Sorry, right? Okay. Did. Um, so we are gathering here uh, on Halloran TV to um, for design meeting um, to do a few things, primarily um, to discuss how to uh, cultivate an embodied justice practice, specifically from the lens of designers. Uh, and Portia and I thought, what better way to do that than to invite some of our favorite other designer facilitator leaders working tirelessly for social justice for many years inside of this field. Um, so what we're going to do today really is just offer some strategies for um, seeding change in the theater design field and the industry uh, as a whole, um, kind of going beyond theory and really going into embodied practice um, and some like, you know, strategies that we use in our own practice itself. Um, so this is really about doing what you can do from wherever you are and all of us can engage in this work in different ways and so we just wanted to provide you with a few examples of what is working for us and maybe that will spark some stuff for you and your practice to take forward um i'm gonna we're gonna try to implement these things throughout the session called meta moments or pop-out moments, um, and this was a term that I first heard when going through um, the Aorta Headwaters training. And what that really means is that um, when we are doing something that is potentially useful, um, that is maybe a teachable moment, we'll like go through that and then we'll pop out and talk about it. Um, for example, what I just did um, was setting the expectations for all of you who are either watching or participating in this about what we're going to be doing. Um, and I find that actually setting the expectations in any session is really helpful because it either allows people to raise any um, red flags about what we're doing, but also just to like gauge what their participation is going to be like. Um, and with that, I am gonna pass it over to Jesse for our check-in. Hello. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna uh, uh, start the check-ins. Um, so I'd like everyone to introduce themselves um, with your name, pronoun, um, land, land acknowledgement, uh, and uh, check in as to whether or not your access needs are met, um, what discipline or disciplines you work in, and how you are doing tonight. So I will go ahead and uh, I'll start first. Um, so my name is Jesse Portillo. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Uh, I am joining this call from my office on the campus of Cal Poly Pomona, which is on the stolen land of the Tongva people. Currently, my access needs are met, and uh, my discipline is lighting design. So uh, tonight, um, I am doing very well tonight. Um, I'm, I'm happy to join this call um, because it... Uh, uh, it represents the end of a very busy and very stressful week. Um, one thing that I forgot to add for the uh, check-in is also for uh, everyone to share what your favorite uh, check-in prompt is. And I'll be honest, mine is, is to ask people how they're doing uh, because I think it's really important for people to... Um, be comfortable saying that you know there are other things on their mind or or that they're distracted by events in their life or in the world um so yeah that that's what i have so um i will hand it over to margaret and then uh margaret if you want to hand it off um as, as you go thank you jesse hi everybody uh, my name is margaret Toomey. i use a she her and they them pronouns um i am zooming in from the land of the Lumbee Nation and Eno peoples and the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation in the colonial named Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, my access needs, um, in terms of access needs, are met, but I do want to name I have a two-year-old and she might make an appearance. So just so nobody um, watching us is surprised, I know my, my fellow attendees are fully aware of uh, my, my daughter. Um, I'm a scenic and costume designer. Uh, and to answer Jesse's question, um, I'm really glad to be in space with you all. 
Um, I also have had a very hectic week and I'm in the process of moving. So it's nice to have this moment, oddly enough, of calm in this great big transition that we're in the process of doing as a family. Um, and one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite prompts, and, and I, this comes with a little bit of privilege when I said, say it, is to be able to place in the conversation, much like pronouns to people naming um, their racial identity, because I'm often in spaces that are mostly white. And I think it's really important as a white person to name that and hold myself accountable um, in meetings to disrupt my white privilege, because that is one of the, the biggest tools I have in these spaces. Um, and I'm gonna also just do a little language check um, and ask my team um, to not use the handoff because that's an ableist way of talking and just say, I'm gonna pass on um, to Alexis to introduce. Thank you, Margaret. Hi, everyone. I'm Alexis Cheney. I use she, her, her pronouns. And I am zooming in from the ancestral and unceded lands of the Tongva people. I am, and I am a costume designer theatrically, but I've pivoted to film and TV where I'm more of a general costumer kind of person, though I still consider myself a designer. Um, my access needs are met, but I am calling from a semi-public workspace. So it is possible I will be interrupted or that my internet connection in the desert will drop. Uh, hope it does it. Um, my favorite check-in prompt, I honestly like when everyone goes around and talks about something great they just ate, because uh, I like food. I feel like food is universal. It also, there's obviously like privileges that come with what you're eating and where you're eating and how, but it is, we do all eat. Um, so as opposed to like hobbies or activities that sometimes can be kind of like fraught and telling, um, I find food to generally be a little, can, can be a little bit more like, okay, let's talk about it. And I love hearing about new recipes and restaurants to try. So I will frequently just be taking notes when people are sharing that. Um, I will now pass on to Kate. Thank you, Alexis. And again, thank you for that offering, Margaret. What an awesome, uh, teachable moment. Um, hi, everyone. Again, Kate Freer, she, her, zooming in from Lenape Hoking, the stolen ancestral homelands of the Lenape peoples. Um, there's a loud car going by in the background. I'm sure you heard that. Um, my access needs are met, though, uh, again, in full transparency, um, I have a fractured foot, so I'm a little uncomfortable, and you'll see me shifting around a lot, um, and that is what is going on there. Um, I am a multimedia artist, a filmmaker, an educator, and an organizer, um, and I am... Okay, it's been a long week, <laughs> um, both with the series and starting teaching um, and myself in school. And uh, I'm really thrilled to be gathering with this group of people and talking about something I really care about um, with folks who are also fighting the good fight, um, but also enjoy having a good time together. Um, and one of my favorite check-in prompts, which is just, I think, says something about me, like saying this into groups to kind of complicate things, um, is uh, what is your relationship with time right now? Um, which is always has a very fascinating number of responses. And with that, over to you, Portia. Ooh, what is my relationship to time? <laughs> uh, sorry, we were doing something. <laughs> Marisha McGovern, she, her, hers, um, continuing to reside on the unsealed lands, the Munsei Lenape and Mopinger, colonially known as Connecticut. There was something else in this prompt. Oh, my access needs are met uh, and my eight-year-old may or may not pop in at some point. We'll see. Uh, I'm a lighting designer. How am I doing? I'm feeling... <laughs> She's singing in the other room. Uh, I don't know if you all can hear it, but I can. Um, I'm feeling very lighting designery this week. I got my first plot in on Monday after 21 months. Um, so I'm feeling very like, I remember how to do things, right? We'll see. 
Um, and my favorite check-in prompt that I usually use the first time when I'm with a group because I, I don't know the level of vulnerability yet is what is your favorite color and why? Because everyone is like, ooh, it's a layup. What is, what is your favorite color? And then the question is why? And folks are like, oh, I have to think. I have to think about why is this my favorite color? Yeah, I think that's it, right? Is that the entire check-in? That's it. Yeah, I'm wondering, Jesse, do you want, thank you for leading our check-in. I wonder if you wanted to talk about why, um, you know, why check-ins are important as a part of practice or what, what the goal is. Um, yeah, so I think, um, you know, it, partly it's an, if people don't know each other, uh, it's an opportunity to learn about each other and um, uh, uh, where people are at uh, uh, physically in the world. Um, and, uh, um, and and that question uh, uh, that Margaret had about uh, naming the racial identity is, uh, that's, there's fascinating potential in that, um, that, that I'm, that I'm thinking about. And, and yeah, I, and, and, and so when people don't know each other, right, it's, just a, a great way um, to get to know each other. But I also think sort of that that other layer that's there about um, how you're doing or or something about you, right, is, is uh, anything that gets below the, the surface level introduction helps us to see each other as the deep and uh, complicated humans that we all are. And I think especially uh, with so much communication happening over Zoom, uh, it, it can be uh, even more important uh, uh, in, in that regard. Totally. Is there anything that anyone else wants to add about the, the beauty of a check-in? Um, I think in a design context, that especially if it's a production meeting check-in, it can be pretty isolating. And, you know, depending on what the makeup of your team is, if you have even been given a team um, at all. But it, yeah, it feels very solo for all that we talk a lot about how collaborative this process is. Um, I have a whole other set of feelings on that lie, but the check-in is very frequently your only chance to say on a human, sort of echoing Jesse on a human to human and person to person level to be like, how are, like, what is the state of the union of like this person? Or like, how can I, with these people that I'm supposed to be making something with, like when is an appropriate time to talk about like how, what is outside of the space may be infecting my work on the inside um, as opposed to, you know, because you can't always send that in an email necessarily, nor should you. Yeah, I just, I wanted to add, um, and especially as we sort of segue into um, a deeper conversation, um, it removes the transactional nature of what I feel like can often be like very quick production meeting opportunities or, or means because we're that relationship to time Kate talked about constantly being driven through the um, kind of meeting a specific expectation of efficiency. Um, and so I think that it's a really beautiful way to disrupt that and to, to give us back our humanity. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I want to shift us a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about um, some of the ways that we are embodying this work and, and our practice in um, the space. Um, one of the things that we were talking about was um, if anybody has something in particular um, other than check-ins to center our humanity, um, that any designer or you in particular um, as your specific design field um, can integrate in your process um, that can make an immediate impact. And we're talking about bringing um, justice into our work um, and fighting this, this uh, against white supremacy. Um, I'm gonna start just so that you all have a second to think about that. Cause I know sometimes you throw a really big question like that and you're like, oh no, don't, don't call on me. Um, the one thing that I've been doing for the last, I don't know, so some odd years at this point 
um, again, positioned as a white person um, and as a scenic designer, um, a, a gender queer, but, but sort of female presenting scenic designer in a male dominated field. Um, I often have to find my find myself thinking, well, I deserve to be here because I'm part of an underrepresented group of people um, in this field. Um, and I constantly have to check that. And so one of the ways that I've been doing that is, is by immediately, as soon as I get um, a contract, is to ask, do I have an assistant? If I don't have an assistant, if I don't have a co-designer opportunity, um, what are your politics around adding money to that or taking my money and splitting it? because there's no reason that I should be the single singular voice at the table. Um, and so that is, that is just like every single design I work at, especially scenic design, but also when I've done costume design work. Um, and it's a way to disrupt that sort of quote unquote pipeline that exists with younger designers who may or may not get opportunities coming out of the educational field um, that they're in is to just like bring them in the room and give them um, assistant if they want to be an assistant if they want to be a co-designer i'm open and i will just be there and we will we will be a team um and, and make sure that i am part of a of making the table bigger not just creating space at the table but literally making the table bigger so that people um designers of color black designers indigenous designers they're they're there sitting with us um so i'm going to just leave it open i'm not going to actually call on anybody does anybody want to um go in and, and talk about that. Um, I'll, I'll add this in. And um, I, I, I first learned of this uh, uh, from Regina Garcia. And it's the practice of, um, uh, you know, as a designer, making sure that you uh, advocate for or recommend introduce uh, three new people uh, every time you work on a production at a theater. And um, that, that, that's the practice that I, that I have started to do. Um, uh, and it's too early to see if uh, there, there's been any, uh, uh, any success about that. But I think um, it's just another way of sort of humanizing um, that there is a, a, a broader field of, of talented and qualified uh, people that um, uh, are ex that exist outside of uh, any theater, you know, producers or any individuals network. There, there are always more people, and anything we can do to humanize that, as opposed to saying, "Well, um, here's a list uh, of potential uh, other other people." I love that. That's so cool, Jesse. Um, what a good idea. It. Um, I think that kind of relates to uh, one of the things that I was thinking about. Um, that you know, I had a. I've had a practice uh, for a long time that many of my other video designer community know about me is that I um, don't hire folks who mirror the dominant class. Um, so I don't I don't hire as my assistants or associates or animators. And this is just a policy that I've had for a very long time. And mostly it's just because I don't believe that um, that, you know, cis white men necessarily need my help getting um, up in the world. Um, and but beyond that, I am very vocal about the fact that the folks that are my collaborators on my design team um, are brilliant designers and really talented. And I speak like I talk them up the entire process. I introduce them to everybody. I recommend them to the artistic directors. Um, that's a big um, thing that just made me think of that. Thank you, Jesse. Um, and then the other thing that I would say about um, something that is specific to my own practice is that I every single project that I take um, before I officially sign on, before I find out who the other designers on the team are, if it is a uh, you know standard like there's a there's a director a, a standard like you know um, everybody has typical positions um, I'll have a conversation with the director and the first thing that we talk about the first question that I asked if they are not offering that back also is what is my way into the production with my specific social identity and location as a cis white queer 
woman um, and like what is my way in. Um, for example, I'm working on uh, Viet Gone um, at Jiva and uh, Peron, who is the director, and I, our first conversation was about that and, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, my way into that is that I am the granddaughter of refugees um, who came to New York in 1942 um, uh, and that also I'm designing this as a American um, who consumed um, that content um, at the same time that the author did. Um, so that is like the the big way and also because I understand what um, the implication of me as a white bodied individual is in a room that is telling the story of somebody else's lived experience. Um, so that is my policy. Would someone repeat what this prompt was since my mm -hmm. internet connection cut out? I feel like I've been kind of understanding, but just to clarify, yeah, Alexis, um, we were we were talking about if there was anything that um, you as a designer or sort of designers as a whole um, can integrate in your process uh, that makes an immediate impact, something that you don't necessarily have to rely on the hiring team per se or anybody else in the room. What is what is something that that you've done or that you you have a policy on or other things that you're like, Gosh, I wish somebody would do this because I don't have the ability to do it. Hmm. The first thing that jumps to mind for me is because I've not frequently been in the position to like hire assistants or just like as like a rising whatever that means um designer but in terms of just where the hierarchy placement has been I have not always felt empowered enough to have these conversations but what I have done both in my personal life and in when I'm working as a designer I have made like a personal boundary about like what's the amount of like oppression I can tolerate. Um, Cause you know, as a living person, like I will have to. And when it's, and it is that bar gets lower every year, um, especially in workplaces. And so I just make a point of saying when something happens, saying something, and that's not something that I used to do. And it is also counter to a lot of, I think the social training, that I was raised with and that a lot of, um, I'm speaking specifically of like the black experience, but I imagine it's similar for children of a generation that broke a lot of barriers. There's frequently a lot of instruction on how to kind of mind your P's and Q's and keep your head down as you like, you, not necessarily you should be grateful to be there, but that you, if you are going to be in a room that doesn't want you, like try not to call attention to yourself by pointing out things like everyone being racist. Um, and it's taken a lot of time to kind of un uh, to both unlearn that well and also understand where that was coming from. But what I has led me to is that if I have to work with you if we're on a team together, there's certain stuff. It was like you're not going to be able to say that around me. You're not going to be able to do that around me. I'm going to say something like regardless of, and that's the, the line is like, this isn't about it, like jeopardizing my career. This is about every day I have to like wake up, like trapped in this like flesh prison um, and moving through the world in this, the, the in, in the way that I embody it. And I'm not going, there's certain things. It was like, I don't, I'm not going to hear it. I'm not going to do it. And that yeah and just every space i go to and even if it's casual even if it's not met well i'm not necessarily getting up in people's faces but that is a line i've drawn for myself to be if that's like if i'm on this project you're not going to be able to talk like that when i'm can hear you or, or and that's what it is um and it has for at least for me has gone really well because it prompts a lot of conversations and a lot of like oh i didn't know and it was like i know you didn't and like it's not about that but i am saying that like you're just not going to be able to stuff like that isn't going to fly anymore. And that has honestly made a year for me. Um, because I also, I personally, I don't always absolve myself of the education element of it, but I have decided if it's a working environment, if you didn't hire me to like facilitate and like teach a course on racism and anti-oppression, then what is most important to me is that I'm not hearing, excuse my language, bullshit, 
or you're not doing bullshit and you're not making bullshit comments. Um, if you want to know why that's bad, you can pay me more and I will be happy to. Um, like would love to, but that sort of the way the way that those two re relate to each other in how I work and design, I think it's made me a better designer in the sense of like it's made a lot of rooms less stressful for me. Um, because it's like, oh, is someone gonna say something? It's like not anymore. <laughs> Or if they do, I won't hear it. So. Anybody, <clears throat> anybody else have anything for share? And I'll, I'll say that like, for me, learning how to apologize well, right? How to, how to do a meaningful apology. And I follow Mia Mingus's like, this is how to do an apology and how to do it well. Um, has made a huge impact on how I behave in spaces, right? Um, I think there's something, you know, people are often like, well, of course you never screw up because you've been working on this for so long. And I'm like, I screw up every day, um, if not every hour and sometimes more frequently. Um, but it's it's learning how to take uh, what other people are offering, right? In terms of both correction and critique and apologizing when my own internalized biases have come up. Um, I did this this week where I was on Zoom and I could not hear people. And I was like, you have to speak up. I'm old. And it was like, oh, um, wow. That was like ageism and ableism all together in one comment, one comment that you did to this huge room. So now you're going to apologize and you're going to explain why you're apologizing to all these people. Um, but it's, that's not, it's, um, it has nothing to do with hiring. I feel like other people said something to do with hiring. Oops. Yeah, no, that's really, that's really great. And, and I think when we think about that, what it is that when we show up in a room um, as an individual designer or potentially in collaboration with other people, um, there's a lot of different techniques that you're sort of tapping into given your positional power, given your, personal capacity um, to do X, Y, Z. Um, but I think one of the things, like the reason that we were talking about this prompt and the reason that we're having these discussions today and all the uh, articles is that um, element of, we have an opportunity to put ideas into the world and to um, suggest that there are different ways that we can do it. And one of those um, ways that that's happening, and, I, and I'm speaking to the two people who are in the field right now in education, Kate and Jesse, um, very specifically in your in your work. But also, I know we all educate because we're in a room. People are looking at us. There's they're taking in what we're doing as designers. So how um, how are these kinds of conversations and ways in which we're, we're shifting the way design is happening? How are you? How is that showing up in your classroom or when you're thinking about being a, a teaching students or being a mentor with mentees, um, sort of open it up there. Like where, where are we in that realm? Um, okay. So I think, uh, uh I, I want to start with, uh, in, in the educational aspect, there's that it's important to name this, um, contradictory, aspect of the work of educators, which is that the educational system in the United States was designed to oppress non-white people. Um, and there are so many points of evidence to that show how successful it was. And on the other hand, right, we also have this uh, uh, long-standing practice within the broader uh, entertainment and live performance uh, industry that has also uh, tended to do the same thing. And if we're an educator who's trying to introduce anti-racist practices in this, we, we have this, um, uh, uh, this conflict in that we're trying to get students to succeed in a system that is designed to oppress them and to prepare them to enter 
this industry so that they can dismantle the oppressive systems that they were required to master. It, right. And there, there's so there's so much in that. And and I think individuals um, are, are so likely to, to lose part of themselves in, in attaining what so many people ha have defined a, as excellence. So so that's something that I, I, I wish I had more answers on uh, uh, and, and a better template for that. So, so I just want to name that. Um, but, th but then the, the second thing that I want to say is I've been trying very intentionally to think about what the process for feedback to students should look like, because, you know, there's so much, so many educators are doing wonderful work in terms of decolonizing their, their instructional materials, decolonizing their courses. Uh, in, incorporating anti-racist texts, right? But but I've heard a lot less dialogue in terms of what is an anti-racist um, what does anti-racist grading look like, and what are we doing, right? If if we change a play title and we still evaluate the work by this um, uh, uh, oppressive system or rubric. Uh, that that we were all, or most of us, if not all of us, were, were trained under, um, and and I'm, yeah, I'm I'm active, I'm actively working on that all of the time. That's such a great point, um, and you know, I've been thinking about this also this prompt, Margaret. Um, as I mentioned, I taught my um, first class of the fall semester with my fabulous co-teacher, Kelly Colburn. We're teaching advanced projections at University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Um, and I have been teaching introduction to projections there for the last three or four years. Um, and I am very like community centered in my class. We start everyone with a check-in. Um, I'm very vocal about the fact that I um, am working to dismantle the oppressive system um, in my education and in my work as a designer. Um, and a big part of that is uh, always um, one, um, asking and inviting the students in my class to like embrace their identity to always like, you know, I ask them to choose the projects that they're working on and to um, explain like, why is it important to be doing this right now? Why do you, as you, as you as an individual, want to do this work and every choice they make to be able to explain why you're putting something out there because, because design is such a powerful tool. Hi, Lucy. Um, because design is such a powerful tool and it can um, subconsciously subconsciously influence an audience there's so much potential to be reinforcing really harmful stereotypes um, but also there's this potential to like really revealing amazing truths and stories um, and then I, I we're gonna start this new system of feedback this semester that I'm really excited about. <laughs> so you just reminded me of this is that, um, and it's very much taken um, from a the Boulet Brothers show, Dragula, just saying, if you're not watching it, you should be, um, where they start off um, basically any sort of judging process by saying, you know, drag is an art form and that's totally subjective. We are just going to be judging you on your execution of the tasks and hands and just like discussing that. So that's where we're starting all of the feedback sessions and we do them as a full group. So it's not just this hierarchical model of instructors giving feedback to the students. It's everybody's, um, you know, discussing it all together. Um, and we're also borrowing some from uh, Liz Lerman's critical response process, where if there's an opinion, um, you seek consent before offering your opinion about something um, and are really specific about um, some of the questions that you're asking. I'm going to do like a small meta moment here to say, 
Um, I, you know, you'll notice that I just named the source of a couple of the, the tools that I'm using. Um, I named the Boulay brothers and Liz Lerman. Um, and then uh, also Portia had uh, named me a Mingus. And so just like as a meta moment, um, we are all practicing sort of acknowledging the source of where this information coming is coming from, because we are all, you know, coming from a long lineage of folks who are, have been fighting this fight. And so it's great to um, put those names forward. Met a moment over. Beautiful, beautiful, Kate. Um, is there anything else anyone wants to, to to add to the education conversation before I shift us a little bit? Anything? Okay, no one's leaning in. So looking at nonverbal cues um, in a space you're facilitating conversations, helpful, especially in Zoom. <laughs> And you can't really get the get the uh, shift in a person's body or their like intake of breath as easily as you do in a real life. Um, so when we think about uh, the times in which we have um, shown up in a space and had to disrupt things that are in place and happening, um, one of the um, ways, one of the things that I think we've all probably experienced in our field, even probably in life, is that element of how language plays a huge role in day-to-day um, -day microaggressions, um, racism, uh, ableism, all those things you named that, Portia, earlier in terms of just not acknowledging when you've made a, made a mistake and you've said something um, that seems innocuous but ultimately has a really big impact. And um, I want to invite um, Alexis. Um, you had a... Uh, a practice and activity that you've done and, and had conversations um, as a costume designer around that language piece, the things that exist in the vernacular of the costume land that are really problematic. And um, would you like to, to talk about that for with us, Alexis? I would. Um, and just to give a bit of a roadmap of what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to go through the exercise. And I've asked my fellow panelists, moderators, didn't just realize, I don't know what we're called, our collective is, um, to come up with a few examples. If you are watching this live or later, please feel free to go through this exercise on your own or listen back to a recording because um, it can prompt a lot of really great conversation. Uh, but to begin, Oh, no, it looks like we might have we might have lost Alexis um, issues with uh, technology. Um, I'm going to give us a little bit more information. So we have Alexis's um, stuff here and Portia, Kate, Jesse, if you want to support as well as we wait for Alexis to get back on. Oh, there she is. Oh. This is real life, everyone. This is how it is. Yeah. Yes, you were on silence, though. Still on silence. Oh, hi. Forgot. I'm in the <laughs> desert. That's that on that. Uh, no apologies for <laughs> the internet connection out here. Uh, the language that we use in fittings in our workroom and design spaces can very frequently make other people feel unsafe and unsupported, even if that's not what you were intending with it, that's what it does. And because of that, there are ways in which even if you yourself may consider yourself an ally, an advocate, a supporter, but through your everyday language, through your jokes, through your casual observations, you are, you can be perpetuating an oppressive system um, in both in that space and in the world at large. And that is it is both a huge thing to change and also a very small thing to change um, is a thing with language. Because we all know, I'm sure we can think of any number of casual slurs that we may have all used when we were younger that at the time seemed impossible to remove from our language, but you were able to do that. So, um, but it does take, you do have to want to do it. Um, sorry, I thought the whole Zoom dropped for a second and I almost made a face. So here are a 
so sorry. I <laughs> keep, I'm worried about my internet connection. So to check in with everyone about how I'm feeling, it's making me feel scattered. So what I have found is that if you are more specific with your language in terms of how you're talking about clothing, performers, your equipment, your space and yourself, you are more accurate and more inclusive. So often the offensive term that we all fall back onto when you really dig into it is not helpful and isn't really saying anything at all. It's like, it's just hurtful. And for what? Like you have not made the situation more clearer. You have not provided a better direction for us to work in. You, you just said something and now here we are back at the start and everyone's hurt. So uh, please be more specific. And to, uh, I'm just going to go through four sort of big categories. Obviously there is way more than this, but just for frequently a word that comes up is ethnic, or I would like it to look more African or oriental, et cetera. To speak to what I just said, what does it mean for something to be African, given that it is an entire continent with many countries, with a huge number of people and languages and cultures inside of it? That is, as a descriptor for something that you want visually, that is a meaningless word to say, oh, I want it more African. So in addition to being offensive. So when you are, when you hear terms like that, or if you see things labeled like that, taking the time to do your research to figure out what do I mean? What country, what people, what tribe, what area, like all of that is going to make a better product in addition to not being wildly offensive, the same like oriental as a term in and of itself is the etymology of that term is racist, but it also means nothing. Cause if you were to literally look at the section of the world that that refers to like okay, what? So you've half the world, that's what you want this to look like. What does that mean? It means nothing. Um, and in terms of equipment, uh, this is something that I've encountered, not personally a lot, but using master and slave as a way to refer to equipment. I think part of why this was brought up earlier, and it's always shocking to me because that seems so obvious. Like, why would you ever refer to something as a master and a slave if it was not quite literally that thing, but people do. But it is also something that if just think about what that relationship is, that's not what you're talking about with your equipment. That's not helpful. Where are, what are the words and what are the ways in which your specificity is just going to be able to drill down to the point? Because if we are collaborating, if we're telling stories, if we're trying to be better communicators, you need to be able to get your idea and your point across more clearly. And these generalized terms are not doing that. Um, gender terminology is another one. Speaking specifically of clothing, cloth doesn't have a gender. Pants have no sexual identity. They are, it is a textile that has been stitched together. So our insistence on gendering it is, while it has basis in what is culturally true, there are so many times we rely on saying, I want a women's shirt, I want a men's shirt. Do you want you want what kind of shirt do you want? Because the gender of it isn't helping anyone and it's meaningless. Also, depending on what you are talking about, the cultural markers of gender are so fluid and changed even in our own lifetimes. I know I have watched men go from wearing like jeans so baggy that two people could stand in them as like the definite sign of masculinity to skinny jeans being what shows you a man and in between. So that is also, so you're like, I want a pair of men's pants. Like, you know what they look like. Do I, do I know what men's pants look like? Do you know what men's pants look like? Men don't know what men's pants look like. That's not helpful. No one is, again, we are back where we started. You're like, so you want a pant. Great. What is, give me an, a color perhaps, a cut, especially for costumes. We have so much and there's frequent conversations about how no one uses the specific terminology for the cut of clothing, but then we'll talk about men's pants, women's pants. Stop being a hypocrite. Um, and, and, and with that, when you are talking about something that means masculine and feminine, what I have found is that 
you we're straddling two wor- two worlds. There is a world in which we want to be beyond the binary and have a better grasp of language, but there's also the world that we exist in now. And I don't think it's helpful if someone says like, I want it to be more masculine to immediately be like, I don't know what that means. Nothing is masculine. You probably do know what they mean, but that's the point to challenge to say, okay, masculine has meant many things over the centuries. It has meant high heels and lace ruffles. It has meant crop tops. It has meant boxy suits. When you say masculine, especially when we're talking about art and characters, it's like, what does masculinity mean for this person? Do we have better, any better descriptions? And it's one thing to talk about masculinity and femininity when it is like the character's gender expression. That is, I think that is something entirely different to say like this character expresses their femininity like this. So when we talk about femininity for character X, this is what we mean. That's different. I think you have clearly created a shorthand for a specific design conversation, but to be in general, say, oh, I would like this dress to look more feminine. Friend, I don't know. Do you want shorter? Do you want longer? Because even as we're saying this, do you want softer? There's lots of associations with femininity and masculinity in terms of adjectives that there are fraught associations there. I sort of rest on that. And when we were talking about describing things, I would rather say I would like it softer, rounder, fluffier than to just say feminine as a shorthand because those things aren't inherently. Again, softness does not have a gender identity. It's just soft. Um, and for sound and lighting, and Margaret, if you, you want to, I. Yeah. Uh, you know, is that when we're using male and female to refer to connectors? Do you want to go into that? Sure. Yeah. And and I want to just name. This is just something I've ex- I've experienced in my life that I'm not a sound or lighting designer. But I do want to name that, um, you know, for years we talk about the connectors being male and female in regards to whether why? or not. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know why, but why? Why? And there's just different ways we can talk about it. I mean, we can talk about the fact that this is the plug and the pin and this is the socket that it's going to plug into. I mean, there we have, like you said, specific, specific ways in which we can actually be more clear when we're communicating with our collaborators. And then our students, our, you know, assistants, et cetera, um, specifically in that way. It's like, we do not need the gendered language around the way this plugs into that. <laughs> right. And I think it mentioned like in the documentation, yeah, if you're reading a manual for it, I, I doubt that they're all using male and female. So if that's your colloquial term and then you're looking up something and it's like, well, the receptacle, you're like, I don't know what that is, which you very well may not. What if everybody had been specific and clear from the get-go? Then you would have the information you needed. Think about that. Um, And the other one, this is for in costumes, when you are in a fitting, that is a deeply, deeply intimate space and body image and how you view the way you are embodied and what you look like is so complicated this is i think obviously i think the best way to approach fittings and that language there is to have a conversation with the person you're fitting um, about terminology but in general the things that i think are helpful to strike out or to just consider more or how calling something really big or really small and like much like the way that soft like round all of those can have associations with like femininity big and small in reference to bodies or garments can carry a lot of fat phobia um, or just general weight related trauma. So are there ways in which just saying like, oh, it needs to be big. It was like, let's talk about where we want the fullness. Where do we need it like to nip in? Where can we use fitted? Again, specificity, I think that's more helpful for everyone in the fitting because you'll know exactly fullness means something else and I want it bigger. It's like, what does that mean? Fullness, okay, I have an idea of what we're talking about there. And and this is, an, and I don't necessarily have suggestions for this, but when things, when garments are not fitting, um, I know there's lots of costume like conversations we've had about this. 
the ways in which we can talk about how when something doesn't fit and making it clear that we are talking about the clothing and that it's an issue with the garment and not the body. Because if somebody is standing there and you're just very frequently talking to the draper, the first hand, the shop manager, not the performer, like holding this thing, being like, oh my God, it's too small. We're going to have to add this, this, and this. Like, how does that person feel? Like, we know we're talking about the garment, but the, for the person standing there in something that is uncomfortable, like that association isn't always going to be there. So is there a way to have the conversations we need and talk about what we need to do that is not sort of, in, even if, again, we're impact where intent doesn't matter. That's not implicitly offering a critique of the body that is wearing the costume. So something I say frequently when I'm in fittings and just with my performers is like, listen, I don't have to wear this costume. Like I just got to design it. <laughs> like I don't have to wear it every night. You need to feel comfortable in it. You need to feel, you need to put it on and feel like I have made your job easier. Like i don't got to put that shirt on. So at a certain point, it is more important that you feel comfortable than like whatever I'm designing work because I don't have to wear it. And if you don't feel comfortable in it, it's not going to work. Uh, chat or helpful strategies for that. I'd love to hear them. Another one would be I have encountered a lot of negative self-talk from performers who sort of come into the room already feeling a way about their body and critiquing it before you can even say anything good or bad and the ways in which to, because again, you don't want to, you're not here to start a fight. You're not here to have someone be like, oh my God, I look so fat and like be like, no, you're not like love yourself. Like that's maybe like not the fitting isn't necessarily time to have that conversation, but ways in which if someone comes in clearly filled with a kind of self hope, a defensive like self-hatred or self-loathing, that you can use that to either, you're not going to change anyone's mind in like a 45 minute fitting, but at least create a space where it's like, hey, this is not how we talk about our bodies or anyone else's bodies here. And just maybe providing the, for the first time in their lives, a fitting space where it's like, you're not going to hear horrible things about your body. Cause even I think sometimes what performers don't think about is when they talk about that, how we feel. Cause as someone who has, swings in and out of plus size, having a woman who is a sample size talk about how fat she is. And then I'm there in the mirror being like, well, if you're fat then, and then again, not to say that they're to imply the negative associations with fat, but as I deal with my own body image, a lot of times that self-talk that is like defensive, that they're protecting themselves. It's like, oh, you're not considering how this is making everyone who is not putting these clothes on in the room feel. So any strategies for dealing with those situations, um, I think are helpful for all of us. And the last thing I want to talk about is consent. Again, like I said, fittings are very intimate and it involves a lot of touching um, of someone, usually someone's naked body or bare body. And I frequently encounter performers who are like, oh, you can do whatever, you can touch me, it's fine. Like, I get it, I'm an actor, which is all very well and good, but I try to create a space where it's like, you have bodily autonomy in this room. Maybe nobody else on the production is giving you that. Maybe it's not happening in the rehearsal room. Maybe it's not happening in like the rest of your career before this point. But when you come into this fitting space, you are in charge of your body and like who gets to see it and who gets to touch it. Um, and so thinking and having, which is, I think a good sort of a vice versa situation. Cause I know we've all encountered situations where I've not been prepared to see someone completely disrobed when I come in and wasn't, and was like, oh, I would have liked to have known that you were fully nude, not like I wasn't expecting that. And that can, so again, that can go both ways. I think sometimes we only think about like, how is this person feeling? And it was like, well, how are you feeling in the fitting? Because if somebody is making you uncomfortable, how can you reestablish consent and how this is going to go? I try to always ask before I touch someone, every time I move my hand, even if it's not necessarily an intimate place, you don't know where people's triggers are. Like I, for one, I have like the back of my neck is one. So whenever generally older men try to do that very camaraderie, like, hey, friend, or on the back of the neck, I do a really fun melt, wiggle, panic to the ground. Um, 
which, you know, is not never fun for all of us, but it's like, oh, this isn't typically a, a point of the body that people tend to think of as sensitive, but it is for me. And so with that, I don't know how you feel about your arms, your elbows, your hips. I want to let you know that I'm coming. And if you don't feel comfortable with me being there, we're going to figure out a way. Again, the conversation is important because it's like, I need to do my job. I need to fit this, but you also need to feel comfortable and not like everything that has happened, that something has been ha- done to you and not with you. Um, and so with that, if any of my fellow panelists have any examples that they encountered of this kind of language, or if they were able to offer better examples, or if there's something that I haven't brought up that you would like to discuss with the group. Um, cause I think having just I, the, like I said, language is such a small change, but it can have a huge, huge impact and it changes the way you see the world as well. Yeah, I just, I wanted to name one of the things that I often think about um, is uh, the language we have around um, color, because what it is in the Western world in terms of how we determine what's, what this color represents, you know, white is pure and and black is evil. And those things don't exist in the same way in um, other cultures. And so it's, again, that kind of feel like this language conversation is about disrupting that shorthand around language that serves the dominant culture, white supremacy, in terms of like American, Christian, male, all those things like we can't just assume everyone has that same knowledge and we can't just, just, and that, and that goes for the audience too. Like when we're thinking about color choices of paint, of our lighting, we have to say like, you know, just because this is what I associate with this, you know, rosy gold color doesn't mean that that applies in the story for the audience, et cetera. So that's the thing that, that this makes me think of. Yeah. And and with that, right, we we don't think about the cultural assumptions that we were raised with, right? Because it, it's sort of innate to us. And um, you know, how how do we um how how do we make work that is interesting and meaningful to an audience that is not us, uh, if if we don't go, if we don't go beyond that. Um but but then the uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to sort of say to to uh, sort of build on what um, Alexis was saying is um, co- uh, consent in terms of touching, right? And I will say, like, for the most part, I'm not a hugger, right? And there, like, there, there's that's for so many people that's such a part of um, uh, uh, their their way of communicating with people and. Um, I'll say it, you know, like I, I really appreciate it if people ask me <laughs> if, if, um, if a hug is appropriate beforehand and also aren't offended in, in the event that someone says no, not no, not now. Right. Um, but but I think that uh, there there's there's. I guess I've become a lot more aware of it because of its absence um, uh, since the pandemic started. You're living in bliss. <laughs> it's always it's, touching you. In some ways, yeah. Yeah. Some of us are touch starved. <laughs> but people not wanting to hug you is 98% not about <laughs> you. And if the 2% that it is, you should look into that. You should think about <laughs> that. Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, Alexis, you brought up uh, this terminology, master and slave, which is like a huge thing in the video world and the sound and the lighting world um, that I know that a lot of us um, throughout the field have been working very hard to change. And it is hard because it is inside of like the actual systems that we use. Um, And there's been some huge wins because people have been talking about it. Um, This big uh, playback software named Disguise 
um, now has changed the terminology in their media server so that it is no longer say master and slave, which is huge. Um, and I'm really lucky to be in a community of video designers where we talk about these things very frequently. We have this uh, text chain and somebody actually, it was uh, David Bengali um, put it to us recently. Um, we, we were celebrating this new change, but also like the other ways in which those terms are used when it comes to footage. There's a lot of the time when you're editing and creating content, there's like the the like master or the source clip and then um, other things along with that. And so we were suggesting that like, the the master footage could be called primary footage um when there's like so many other ways to um refer to something and that sort of specificity and like that um active uh, exercise of just using just substituting other more specific terminology um another word that comes up all the time in uh group collaborations somebody will say come like let's powwow about this and every time i hear that word i'm just like oh my gosh <laughs> I like I can't uh, I cannot believe um, but it's it's that's the amazing thing and this is often how I bring that up in this space when somebody is using powwow I say like gosh like language is so fascinating how things you know get um, become instinctual um, and you know for me who is someone that works and collaborates with a lot of Native American and indigenous artists to Turtle Island is that when that word is used it's really culturally specific and it's often not at all what people are talking about when they're saying let's powwow um, and so you know saying like let's gather let's have a group discussion um, yeah, that's, and then I'll just say the other term that I just like absolutely hate um, is best practices. Um, I feel as though this idea of best practice is like um, reinforcing this like hierarchy, like there is only one right way to do something. Um, so in uh, in uh, USA A29 and our projections committee, we're like working on common practices. And then I also like know that like there's things that work right for me and there are so many ways to do anything but like this is the my preferred way to do it and it's definitely going to be different for everybody else um that is inside of the field um that's what i'll offer do you have anything to offer i was just thinking about assume best intentions how i'm always like i don't know y'all why should i assume best intentions upon your part i don't know you um right that it's I, I know it's often used as a community agreement and but i'm often like uh or even if it's a room where i know people i'm like oh no i know some of you and i know not to assume best intentions on your part <laughs> like i have learned and i took note um but then i i always feel a little um shy being the person to be like i hate that community agreement <laughs> could we could we change that that community agreement probably was put in there by some white people who don't want to be seen as the bad white people. So I'm going to take it on myself to call that out next time when I'm in a group agreement list. Um, I want to go back and we have a little bit more time and I want to, I, Kate, you had an, had a, had an exercise slash thing that you've, you've um, wanted to talk about and it ties into um, your best practices piece, this kind of concept of hierarchies, but there is this sort of like singular top-down way in which decisions are made, people um, do things, et cetera. And you, on a bigger scale, organizationally have um, some stuff to talk about in regards to hierarchy and how we dream into a different way of that collaboration that Alexis says is a myth currently in our system. Thanks, Margaret. Yeah, I'm going to screen share for a second. Um, I'm going to screen share this image that might look shockingly familiar to a lot of people. It is an image of a standard, a traditional hierarchy that exists inside of the theater industrial complex. And it's very clear, you know, we've got the producer on the top. You know, and you can read the other things here um, of a production manager and a director, and then it flows from there about it's it's who holds the power where and also like decision making. Um, and it's even broken down into performance and design and technology 
like stacking those um, in value order, basically. I don't necessarily agree with this. Um, it looks very different in many spaces. For example, the fact that costume designer, lighting designer, scenic designer, sound designer is all on one. And then, oh, look, projections is below, which kind of cracks me up. And it's connected to lighting and scenic. I don't know. What is that? But then if you really look at uh, the, you know, so, so many conversations that I've had with fellow designers is that everybody has a different perception of the design hierarchy. You know, the way that I perceive it is could be very different. And there's so many different factors inside there. I tend to think that when it comes to design hierarchy, scenic design is on the top and a lot of the things will like correspond actually to how much you get paid. Um, and then, you know, maybe costume design would be underneath that. However, there's all of these in terms of pay, but like in the union, um, but, and also in recognition, but also there's all these other wild things that impact costume, like the fact that lots of times there's no wardrobe support or they're in a fully different space or it's like considered women's work and like all of these wild things that happen when it comes to like the hierarchy, you know, but, and, and then the, it's also, you consider like who's getting hired when, right? It's like, when is somebody being brought into the process? Oftentimes um, I like, will be chatting with sound designers and everyone is lamenting about like, why is sound the last one hired or why is projections the last one hired? Um, so just to say is that there's no like set actual hierarchy, but there's a lot of perceptions and assumptions about hierarchy. Um, so I'm going to stop screen sharing for a second. So just to say that that diagram is very ugly um, and it is not like it's not like based in something that everyone has agreed upon in this and i've probably said some things that are assumptions that i that might offend people <laughs> and other people will you know um have different assumptions about what the hierarchies are um and you know um so I do not subscribe to this hierarchy. I think it is hooey. It's something that I am fighting against in my own work. Um, and so I wanted to introduce an exercise um, that I um, did with my uh, dear collaborator, Marika Kent, um, as a part of uh, the team um, has a uh, devising within a democracy series. And we hosted something um, called Cultivating uh, Design, um, where we asked folks to instead imagine um, what, uh, like, if they could dream a collaborative structure, what that would be like, what that would look like, how that would function. Um, and so we, we showed them this uh, model of hierarchy um, and then asked everybody to take five minutes um, to dream up what um, their collaborative structure would be. And then we would all, when we offered them, when we uh, gave them the prompt of imagine your dream collaborative structure, we said, you know, this is not a test. Um, and to like point out that like maybe there are other structures um, or, or systems um, in art making or in your family or in activism and education and history and community that you feel safe or liberated. And what can you borrow from those structures um, in, in this dreaming. Um, and this is like an opportunity to, again, disrupt and reimagine power and hierarchies and what uh, identifiers you would include inside of those systems. Um, and so I um, will show a very quick example and then um, uh, pass it over to my fellow facilitators um, to show um, some of theirs if they have created some, because I offered this prompt to everybody as we were preparing for this, this time together. Uh, hold, please. So I created uh, three very quick drawings, and these actually I did in real time in the session. Um, so this is one. Um, it's because uh, I put a bunch of dots, which represent people, um, and that everybody was in space, and there were connections between um, all the different people in all the different ways. And so there was no, there's no stack here. It's just about relationships and connections and what people have to offer, and it. And it goes both ways. I could even like put some arrows in here that had it going both ways. Um, I also um, drew this, uh, which is four overlapping circles in this very, 
you know, fun Venn diagram, which is actually um, the logo of uh, my collective, All My Relations Collective. Um, and they sort of represent different areas of focus in our work and the different folks who are working there and show that, you know, there is individuality, but then there's also a lot of overlap. Um, and again, the circle motif is a very powerful symbol. Um, and I don't remember why I made this one, but again, is the idea that like it is one large circle and then people are um, intersecting um, in their circles, um, but they're also um, in control of their own space as well. Um, and so I will again, stop screen sharing and I'll ask if any of my fellow facilitators um, have any dream collaborative structures that they've cooked up that they would like to share with the, the space. We oh, drew, drew the same thing as you <laughs> with the Venn diagrams. So imagine that twice, but I drew mine in red. Uh, I, I had drawn something with uh, everyone was sort of lateral to each other uh, on this same plane, but um, I, I'm not sharing because I favor the Venn diagram more. Kate, hey, you've just, you've solved it. So you, I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry to say, I was like, Kate, hey, what does it feel like solving this problem? You did it. I'm going to call the Pulitzer Committee. Mm, oh God, uh, <laughs> Margaret or Portia, do you have a a collaborative model? I tried to draw this thing with hands and like multiple hands holding each other, right? In terms of like holding each other up, but I can't actually draw, so I'm not going to show it to y'all because I realized when I looked at it that I was like, "What was this? Oh, this was me trying to draw like hands." Um, this was not a thing, but it was something about like how how we're all simultaneously holding each other but i think the venn diagram probably explains that better than like how many hands can i have in this picture I, in my mind's eye mine was also basically your vent your multi-circle venn diagram so yeah so you, you you solved it kate we're check um but I, in all seriousness i think it's really important to talk about those hierarchies and and I think as designers or as people who are making sort of like creative decisions, even if you're in collaboration with a co-designer or an assistant designer, there are people that the structure has set up for you to be sort of at the top of to disseminate information. And when we disrupt that and we talk about collaborations and lateral communication, um, that's when we, we probably get some really, I mean, I, I can speak to very specific experiences of mine, but, and I'm sure you all too, but I would say that that's when we get really fruitful and really like innovative ideas on, on our stages, on our screens. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, the way that these uh, hierarchies, I think show up um, or are, are present uh, in even our collaborative processes uh, are reflected in, I, like I said before, you know, the order in which um, design departments are called on to report in production meetings. So a way to disrupt that is to change up the order of that. Um, it's reflected in how much pay we get. It, it is reflected in how much support we get. Um, so to be able to sort of disrupt that is to, um, you know, one thing is just talk with people, you know, talk with your collaborators, talk with the, the your community about how much you're getting paid, um, what support is being offered, how much different, uh, you know, because that's, that's a great way um, to, again, then like come back to an institution and say, hey, like, you've given this department a $20,000 budget and I know they're not using all of it and I'm getting a $3,000 budget and I'm like desperate to try to accomplish my task. Like what about sharing resources? And if we're talking about this as a community, then you can figure out that resource sharing in a really, um, you know, a great way because we are after all hired to be creative problem solvers. 
so if we are putting people and the the work of creating the art first um, and things second, um, then then you know I think that we can do amazing things, especially in this moment that we're in, where you know there's a lot of talk about embracing um, abundance, but a lot of people and institutions are feeling a lot of scarcity and fear. Um, so how do we how do we re-examine the way that we're thinking about resources and valuing each other and really um, you know coming together to create something um, as a team? Yeah. I I want to tie this in and I'm gonna give a little shout out to Portia and she's gonna go, ah, don't do this. But that I mean I think a lot about when you talk about the um, compensation and where the resources are being spent in um, organizations and on teams. I mean, looking at Porsche's uh, research over the last um, three years, however many, six years that she's been doing it in terms of who is designing in our theaters, what are, what are their identities and the ways in which that sort of intersectional like investigation, we can look at the re the heavily resourced, heavily paid, have like well-paid divisions predominantly um, I, people who identify as male. Um, and then if you, if we were to really dig into it and get even further into it, we would probably, we would definitely see a large amount of those men being white. Um, so I just want to name that and, you know, shout out to Portia for all of her, the work you've done in terms of bringing that to light, because that, I think when we think about shifting hierarchies and shifting away from and disrupting these, these problematic structures, that transparency, either because we share that information with our collaborators and we say, this is what I'm making, this is what support I'm getting, or somebody like Portia going in and digging into it and bringing it to light is what is going to shift um, the conversation. Um, with that, um, is there any other piece of the discussion we want to have, or shall we go ahead and move into, speaking of Portia, our closing? That was a beautiful transition and also echoing the deep gratitude that I feel to Portia for the work that she has been doing in service of the field. I know I'm not going to stop. I'm sorry, <laughs> but very much echoing that, um, you know, it's it, it's one thing to, you know, the thing that I find so funny about that work is that I like knew it was bad, but I didn't know how bad. Um, and so really seeing those numbers um, was really affirming. Um, and so I think that, again, the more that these conversations have, the more that work that we're doing to bring to light many of these issues that are, um, you know, keeping um, keeping us away, like, uh, from having a field full of equity and justice, um, the more that we actually speak about those as a community, um, this, the closer we get to actually creating a more just and equitable uh, field for designers for theater, hopefully for the world. Um, so with that, I'm just going to uh, say, I'm gonna start our close out and then uh, hand it over to Portia for our very, our final exercise. But I just wanted to name everything that we've done in this very short period of time. Uh, it's been almost an hour and a half and we start out with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we named the moment that we are in. Uh, we went through introductions and checking in. Uh, there were some meta moments. Uh, there were some strategies um, for actually um, uh, implementing change inside your own practice uh, as a designer or just a, a theatrical um, artist um, or technician. We spoke about education, uh, feedback loops, language that we're using, collaborative structures and hierarchy. Um, and then I just named everything that we did back to sort of reinforce what it was, which I am going to say, this is a beautiful practice that I learned um, in art equity uh, facilitator training from uh, Michael Robertson, um, which I have found extremely useful, not only for myself, but in other spaces um, that I am facilitating, because um, we did a lot. Uh, and now I'm gonna hand it over. I'm going uh, to ask Portia to lead us uh, in uh, our closing exercise. I'm just going to say this, though, before I go on the closing exercise. Data is just the beginning step, right? It's a beginning step to show, look, there really is a problem. It's what people do with that data that matters. Um, so we're going to do 
three breaths in your own time, in your own space. I am not going to count for you. I am not going to tell you to hold it for a certain amount of minutes or to not have breath for however many seconds. I'm not going to do any of that. It's whatever feels good to you, whatever feels best for your body. Feel free to close your eyes or look off in the middle distance if that's better. Um, the first breath is, as always, for you. The second breath is for your communities, your families. And the third breath is for the community we're building right here in this room. I love doing this and then wait watching for people's eyes to open. Cause I'm pretty sure that's when they've done the three breaths. It's a thing. Uh, meta moment. See, so look, yeah, another meta moment of like, you can watch cause people's eyes will open. Uh, thank you everyone here. Thank you, Jesse and Margaret and Alexis. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, our interpreters, Steve and Pam from TrueBiz ASL and Sean, our captioner from the National Captioning Institute. Thank you, HowlRound for having us. Thank you, audience, whenever you may be watching this, whether you're watching us live or you're watching us sometime later. Thanks for coming along with us. And hopefully we'll get to see you all soon. And look, I'm three minutes early, Kate. So what do we, wow. what do, we do with the three minutes, with the extra three minutes? I think we can just say we're gifting back three minutes. Another, another meta moment. It is okay. All we've done is give everyone gifts. <laughs> and one final <laughs> gift. You're welcome. <laughs> viewer <laughs> everyone thank you bye thanks for coming <laughs>